also <clears throat> bowing to the people online as well. As all of us here on this first night of session. So, waking up, what is it? It's Jen falling into the basket of food. <laughs> 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 you know, waking up is, in a sense, falling into the most profound intimacy with reality. That is what it is. You could say the falling away into profound, vast intimacy. Another word for it is emptiness. How strange that intimacy and emptiness know each other so deeply. Another word for it is equality, vast equality. A sense of everything in its own right, completely here, completely matters, is completely interwoven and seamless with every single particle of matter each moment each beat of your heart. So that's where the first night of, intim of intimacy, of session, <clears throat> points us. And because we're here on the mountain, on Konanyi, also known as Kuan Yin these days, <clears throat> it seems somehow a good idea to take up the Blue Cliff Record as the mainstay of what we're doing in this session. <clears throat> now the Blue Cliff Record happens to be an 11th century uh, collection of cases, koans, compiled in the 11th century by Suedo, and then taken up by Yuan Wu the next century along. <clears throat> adding not just verses and remarks, they were already there from Suedo, but Yuan Wu created a sort of series of summaries and introductions and gathered them together under the name, the Blue Cliff Record, named after the place where he was giving these talks on the cases of the Blue Cliff Record. And you have to admit, it's a beautiful name, the Blue Cliff Record. If that doesn't evoke the, something of the mysterious quality of the reality we're in, what does? Now, the first case of the gateless gate, as everybody knows, is Jojo's Moo, M-U, Moo. So I thought it would be good to see what the first gate of the Blue Cliff Record, how much it echoes, answers to, reverberates with the same vast emptiness of Jojo's Moo. So we'll bring them together and see what they have to say to each other. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the first case is actually, the first case of the Blue Cliff Record is known as Bodhidharma's vast emptiness. And Bodhidharma, of course, is a historical figure with a lot of mythic, uh, trailing a lot of mythos as, as he goes, a lot of rich mythical associations and, and details. And we don't discount that, we accept that as valuable. It has richness of its own and it's telling. The details are telling details about Bodhidharma. No wonder they accumulated around him. So Bodhidharma is this, counted as being the first Chinese ancestor, although of course he was Indian, but the one who crosses over from India to China. This is not to say there wasn't already Buddhism in China for at least four, five hundred years before the time of Bodhidharma. But what Bodhidharma brings is this acute case 
a vast emptiness. And Chan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, from then on, is deeply marked by this matter of the rich productive quality of doubt and how it opens us beyond ourselves, brings us home right where we are. <clears throat> and it's purely accidental that the emperor of the Bodhidharma encounters the emperor of that day when he arrived from China, from India in China, was Emperor Wu, and Wu <clears throat> happens to be the Chinese way of saying Mu. Even though the character would be different, the sound is the same. So, <clears throat> Potadama arrived in China as the red-bearded barbarian. Anybody from outside China was obviously, self-evidently, a barbarian. And to make it even clearer, he had a big, bushy, red beard, the kind of beard not known much in China. And so he arrived fresh from China after three years of travel by sea around the, the coast, uh, the islands of the South China Sea. <clears throat> so he probably wouldn't have been terribly fresh when he arrived. <laughs> He was commissioned by his teacher, Prajnatara, or Pranyatara. So in our lineage, Pranyatara is counted as the last of the Indian um, ancestors coming down through then to Bodhidharma and onwards to us right here on the side of Kunanyi. And Pranyatara is interesting. I'm not going to go into detail, except for this particular possible detail about Pranyatara, which is that he was in fact a woman. That Pranyatara is, was in fact one of those glossed over women ancestors turned into, or fuzz, the detail being fuzzed because it was not easily acceptable to a deeply patriarchal order. <clears throat> so that's a footnote, but I rather like it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and Bodhidharma himself was of high, reasonably high-born character. He was the third son, therefore not the heir, of a warrior king. <clears throat> or rather a king of a warrior caste in South India. So that's where he stems from, and this is the case. I'll give it to you in the way it's given in the Blue Cliff Record, but there's a little bit to add to it after that. <clears throat> so Emperor Wu of Liang, that means of the dynasty Liang, asked Bodhidharma, what is the first principle of the holy teaching? And Bodhidharma said, vast emptiness, nothing holy. Clearly the emperor was rather shocked by this, and I'll come back to the reason why. And he said, who stands before me? Who is this person confronting me? And Bodhidharma, from the depths of his being, replied, I don't know. The emperor, it is said, did not understand. <clears throat> you can hear something very sad about that fact. Here was a most remarkable figure, sort of hauled up into the court because people had heard about this powerful, strange character in front of the emperor, and the emperor, with all of his high seat of power, could not divine anything about Bodhidharma. He did not understand what was being offered, what kind of wind, pure wind, was blowing through that encounter. So Bodhidharma pretty much gave up. He crossed the river, that would be the Yangtze River, a vast river which 
he crossed on a single palm leaf, palm <laughs> branch, which is pretty good. I think. It's good. Well done. <clears throat> And he went on to the kingdom of Wei. Now this is in the west Hunan province. And later, <clears throat> the emperor took up this matter with one of his, um, I guess you could say, helpers, <laughs> Duke Ji. And Ji asked, Your Majesty, do you know yet who that was? The emperor said, I don't know. Ji said, that was the Bodhisattva. Avalokiteshvara, also known as Kuan Yin, conveying the mind seal of the Buddha. The emperor felt regret and wanted to send a messenger to urge Bodhidharma to return, but she said, there is no use in sending a messenger. Even if everyone in the country went after him, he would not return. So there's a lot of interesting detail in this encounter. <clears throat> and in fact, the conversation I just read out was slightly preceded by two things. The first one was the emperor asking Bodhidharma, what is the true meaning of Buddhism? <clears throat> and Bodhidharma replied, Buddhas are embodiments of emptiness. How can they be caught in true or false? <clears throat> and so this emperor, who by the way was also known as the Imperial Bodhisattva, I hear a slight contradiction there, <laughs> the Imperial Bodhisattva, but he was named that way because he was such, he was devoted to the idea of Buddhism after he got over a very long and bloody war and settled down, he, he actually, from his own <clears throat> treasury, funded temples and translations, and he even had a kind of little secret passageway between the imperial court and a quite modest building where he would go and dress as a monk sometimes and practice, just like us, here in this room. And he would try to not hear all the demands to come back, but eventually he did hear them and he would come back and resume being an emperor. Again, so he's not to be laughed at. He's to be taken seriously in his deep intent here. So <clears throat> the next thing he asked, given all of the above about how he had supported Buddhism and gained in the eyes of a certain kind of Buddhism great merit as a result. So he actually asked Bodhidharma, what is my merit? Bodhidharma said very simply, no merit, no merit at all. <laughs> That's a nice, clean, clear statement. And yet, <clears throat> There is, of course, the sense of this great giving impulse in Bodhidharma, this impulse of dana, is in fact the, <clears throat> the first principle of the holy teaching. That is the first and last and most important of the parameters or perfections of mind. Generosity, giving. <clears throat> So what's sort of flowing through this repudiation of the idea of merit is actually something more like luckily or mercifully. This no merit is abundant everywhere, everywhere you look, no merit. Have you seen this yet, Emperor? There's something quite poignant about how these two faced each other, two quite different forms of powerful presence and could not find a chord. <clears throat> and obviously, Bodhidharma didn't reach him when he said, the first principle of the holy teaching is vast emptiness, nothing holy. And he followed that up, of course, with when asked, who is this confronting me? 
Who is this standing before me? And Bodhidharma said, I don't know. Is there a problem that we have to fix up? They want this closer. Sounds not good. Sounds not good, okay. Can you hear Susan now? Can you? Okay. Yes, for us I can hear. It's wrong here. Okay, great. Okay. So what we're left with is this, this sense of vast emptiness, nothing holy, and the resonance of I don't know. The invitation, actually, to the kind of profound doubt that you can rely on to bring you all the way home. There's not knowing, this road of intimacy. But of course, vast emptiness, nothing holy, that, it, it, it takes away everything, does it not? It's ex uncompromising. It, Bodhidharma, if you've seen images of him, the way he's often present, always presented, in fact, is looking over his shoulder with one burning, unavoidable eye that's looking directly at you. That fierce single eye of awake, the, of, of clarity. But can you hear how deeply vast emptiness, nothing holy, is in fact celebrating the fact of being unencumbered, undivided, un no longer alienated from a single thing? It might take a while for this to reach you. It certainly will take years of practice for it to truly confirm you. But in the meantime, it is the fact, the fundamental fact. So then, alongside that, the first case of the gateless gate <clears throat> is, of course, mu, this one word, which comes very close to avoiding any kind of word at all. Its closest translation would be something like not or is not or less than no, Something like un, <laughs> I think un is close enough, because it undoes every meaning you try to put upon it, luckily. So the case is familiar to most people. A monk asked Jojo, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? And Jojo responded, moo, which, undoes having and not having and monk and Jojo and you and me. It undoes all difference, all separation, if you let it have its way with you. If you really look, there is no monk, no Jojo in that moo. And I'd like, you to, I'd like to, us to just get a feel for how close this is to Bodhidharma's vast emptiness, nothing holy. Wutsu, who was in fact Yuan Wu's teacher, Wutsu commented, if you can see into this vast emptiness, nothing holy, then you can return home and sit in peace. Now what kind of, what a beautiful image of, of intimacy that offers. Sitting at home in peace with the fire, at the half, at the heart of intimacy, at the heart, in fact, of reality. So how interesting that something as vast as the night sky is somehow deeply intimate and the way back to sitting at peace. You know, it blazes with a trillion stars and planets, not to mention 
the other inconceivable aspects of the cosmos. And yet, it is also our most intimate home place. If we can embrace that vast emptiness, nothing holy, if we can discover it as our own reality. So bring it into your life. Where do you feel it? Where can you find it? Where can you feel the blessing of this? This unfettered invitation. What does it look like? You know, it is beyond knowing, and that's its great value. It's beyond knowing, and it is also earlier than knowing. And that's why not knowing is the path of intimacy. And of course, this goes on being explored right throughout any Zen session. We bring it up in lights on the first night, But it never stops being the deep question. And what it brings along with it is the deep question of this very self. It undoes the knowing of this very self, such that the Emperor Wu can say, who is this sitting before me? And when Bodhidharma says, I don't know, can you hear how wide open that response is, how profoundly honest. It has no tickets on it, it has no rank, it has no priority anywhere. It's the plain fact, we are unknown beings. When we can actually embrace the unknown quality of each other, chance, love has a chance. That's where love opens. We can see how mysterious beings are with the eyes of vast emptiness. Nothing holy. Now, if nothing is holy, what is not sacred? What is left that does not count completely? Completely in its own unrepeatable form. So there's no merit, there's no first principle, there's no last principle, there's no teaching, there's no emperor, there's no Bodhidharma. There's just this dimension in which every ordinary thing is mysterious and present, completely present. Robert Aitken commented, unless you can acknowledge I don't know to the very bottom, you can never return home to sit and sit in peace. Instead, you will live your life to the very end in meaningless yakety yak. And I don't find that very attractive proposition. So there's two I don't knows in this case, of course, and the first of them, Bodhidharma's I don't know, actually has infinite provenance within it. Infinite room for you, me, all things. Emperor Wu's I don't know is very different. He's standing outside looking in, or he's perhaps hiding inside, looking out. There is actually something else there which is worth noting, which is a kind of honesty. It is very good to be able to say, when it's completely true, (laughs) I don't know. I don't know him, he said about Bodhidharma. So there's a kind of door opening. He's not yet aware, but he's prepared to be completely honest. It's interesting that after Bodhidharma's death, when Emperor Wu heard about this, 
he ordered a, a monument for Bodhidharma. And he had inscribed on it these words, Alas, I saw him without seeing him. I met him without meeting him. I encountered him without encountering him. Now, as before, I regret this deeply. And of course, he did feel regret. He did ask, bring him back. And emperors are used to saying things like that, bring him back. <laughs> People rush out and drag someone back, but no. Duke Xi says very clearly, there is no coming back, no coming or going in that man, in that person. There's no coming back, there's nothing holy, there's no one to be lost, there's no one to be found at that level, that intimate level. And so there's nothing to attach any order to at all. So, Bodhidharma is said to then have gone north and northwest actually and found this sort of abandoned temple in ruins, half ruins, attached to a cave and he took up wall gazing meditation. There's, there's some argument or sort of um, discussion about what that actually means. Was it literally turning and facing the wall as we do? We maintain that old <clears throat> uh, line of practice intermingled with facing in, facing out. But what he's facing, of course, is the wall in the sense of himself until it is transparent, until the entire wind blows right through. So he's facing himself with no front, no back. Quite a lot later, about um, uh, 600 years after Bodhidharma's passing, a monk came to Yunmen and asked, what is the Tao? Or, what is the way, another way of putting it, but it's also asking, what is Buddha? A little bit like the, the question that Emperor Wu started off with. It's also, of course, always asking, what is this self? Who the bloody hell is it? <laughs> I'm quoting Uncle Max when I say that. <laughs> so asked, what is the Tao? Yunmen replied, to break through this word. You can ask for yourself, what is that word? Of course it could be Mu. It could be the, your own very name. But the monk says, what is it like when one has broken through and Yun Men says, a thousand miles, the same mood. A thousand miles, the same mood. I hope you can hear the generosity in that. The lack of inclination to separate anything out, judge one better or worse or greater or lesser, or even just simply different. This sense of the heart at such deep peace with itself that there's no need to stir in the direction of separating out. A thousand miles, the same mood, the one great mood when you're not in your own way. And it is actually the case that Bodhidharma traveled a thousand miles after that encounter with Emperor Wu. The same mood, vast emptiness, nothing holy. And while it's the same mood for a thousand miles, it's also one quite remarkable and distinct, unrepeatable Bodhidharma with his red beard and his rough barbarian manners, very distinct as well. We have to embrace these as not two no separation and bright particular. I mean, look at us, look at us. We're unrepeatable, have you noticed? 
each of us. So vast emptiness, nothing holy or moo. We're, we're being asked here to fast the mind with moo, with this vast emptiness. You fasten your mind with moo and you fasten your heart on moo. It has to have a strong call on your heart to break through this one word. And <clears throat> there's an old Celtic fairy tale that I think has a lot to offer to the student of Mu. This opens on a dark, more stormy night, very difficult circumstances, dark as anything except for a single light. And the young woman traveling across this difficult place makes her way drawn to that light. She finds it's a house with light burning in the window. She knocks on the door and they let her in. And when she walks in, she finds they are keeping company, watch over a corpse lying in a bed. And this is the night of staying with the corpse. Everybody's staying up with the corpse. And when the young woman walks in, they, she, they say, yes, it's a terrible night. You can stay the night, but we're going to bed. You have to sit with the corpse. Not only that, whatever happens, you must not lose track of the corpse, which is an interesting <laughs> development. So she agrees, it's a very bad night outside. This looks like a better proposition. So she sits down and everything's going as it normally does until at a certain moment the corpse sits bolt upright and then flies out the window. <laughs> and she has to not let go, not lose track of the corpse. Perhaps you've got a corpse-like aspect of yourself that needs close tending as well, but that's in brackets. So then <clears throat> the most remarkable night takes place where she is clinging on to the corpse as the corpse flies over mountains and down dales and under the waters of great lakes and then up again. And this goes on all night until <clears throat> the first light of dawn. And in the first light of dawn, they stand on more steady ground and they turn and look at each other. And I guess you could say they see their true face in each other. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of love there and a lot of recognition. And she has seen this one matter all the way through. She has not let go this dark night, this rich night of not knowing of, but and also of not letting go, of fastening her heart on this inexplicable matter. It's the same with Mu. It's the same with this question of what is this? Who is this? Where? You know, what is this remarkable reality and why am I one or two cold steps back from it too much of the time? You know, you can look at the sun rising and unfortunately say, oh, look, the sun's coming up. Isn't it beautiful? And be at that moment just standing a little further back from the fact. It's like, it's like devouring the fact with knowing before it has a chance to breathe and speak its own strange words. That's why the silence of Sashin is so valuable. Words are put aside. We fast the mind on words, from words. And that's where <clears throat> a reconciliation 
not just with yourself, but with this wild cosmos becomes possible. And that young girl, she lived the question of what the hell is happening. She stayed with it. She lived the question. And that question was able to come deeply alive at the end of that wild ride. So there is no right way or perfect way of, of working with Mu. There's no one way. There's your way. Every human being is a fresh theory of opening to Mu, of letting Mu open. <clears throat> so just like that young girl, it, there's, a, quest, there's a, a matter of trusting the difficulty. Nobody could say that our Zen practice is without difficulty. I think everyone can agree with that. It asks everything of us. And it can be painful. It can be testing. It can test us deeply. But isn't that part of its great value? And how many times can you, how many lives can be lived these days on the earth without anyone truly offering a profound test, an initiatory test? Well, Mu and this practice offers exactly that. And of course you can trust the difficulty. Everybody knows when you look closely that all <clears throat> true creativity, all true discovery depends upon difficulty, depends on, upon breaking past yourself. Difficulty is the gold guarantee of breaking past yourself. Rilke had an interesting thing to say in one of those letters to a young artist that everyone um, got to love. They're beautiful letters. He said, everything alive trusts in what is difficult. Everything in nature is spontaneously itself, tries to grow and realize itself against all or any opposition to that fact. And I think that's a kind of beautiful description of how complete everything of the natural world immediately is to any human being half awake. I mean, just take birds, for example. Who can go past birds? <laughs> and how, how completely they are defined and, and refined and shaped and, and made magnificent by the endless difficulty of their lives. They're completely present. They are complete with every detail of what's going on. They are sudden in a way that is, well, it breaks my heart. I think their suddenness and their immediacy is just pure presentation of this sense of trusting in what is difficult. Like, let's us trust in what is difficult. It's also true that every human, well, every organism longs to be comfortable, <laughs> longs to be more comfortable, but doesn't comfortable eat away the soul. If it's just comfort, if there's no edge of call on us, no difficulty that calls on us, that asks <laughs> us to be all that we are, to find out all that we are, and, and to live up to that, to live into that, So there's birds on one side of, of Mu, and on the other side of Mu, there's the grave of my favorite Japanese filmmaker, Ozu, which one of these little round-shouldered, rounded kind of gravestones. And all that it has written on it, he was often called the most Japanese of filmmakers, but also the most Zen of filmmakers. And all that is on his grave is the character Moo. No dates, no name. Just Moo. And doesn't this bring together the unborn and the dead in timeless accord? 
A thousand miles the same mood. So we come and go from clarity over and over again. Rest assured, it's again and again before we go back in to the thousand miles one mood, I guess you could say. But we also touch it again and again. If, if we practice, if we let practice grow us aware enough to notice who this is, what this is. So look for Mu right where you are at every point as these days go on of Sashin. We walked on the mountain, uh, on the ridge, one ridge of the mountain this, this afternoon. Every single detail looked back at us to find Mu. Every single detail offered Mu direct and complete and saw it in us. Next time you're walking there, keep that in mind as you you see the twigs and the, the broken stone fragments and the tiny bones and the great trees and the the marvel of it all. There's not a single thing that leaves out Moo on that mountain or in this room. And come to it again and again. You know how when you've got a, a missing tooth or a tooth is something fallen out. I remember this as a child when when you start to lose your teeth and your tongue goes to that space again and again and again. You know, it's a crater in your mouth. Well, it's a bit like that with Moo. Let your whole being go to that crater again and again and again. Examine the quality of no thing at all. No thing isolated anywhere in the cosmos at all. <clears throat> There's a poem I'll end with by Rio Khan. Everybody loves Rio Khan. Impossible not to love <laughs> Rio Khan. <laughs> that lovely, playful um, monk and commoner um, whose life was simplicity itself in, in a beautiful way, a very playful way as well. He always kept a little um, cloth ball in his pocket just in case children came along and he'd immediately start playing with them. Or else he'd play hide and seek and sometimes they'd all get called in for their suppers or to have a bath or something. And he, if he was hiding and they hadn't found him yet, he'd stay hiding. And one time someone (laughs) came out and found him behind a tree in the dark and said, what are you doing, Rio Khan? He said, shh. So that playfulness is part of working with Mu, playing with Mu, letting Mu play with you. It's full of this poem. He says, in all ten directions of the universe, there's only one truth. When we see clearly, the great teachings are the same. In fact, they're the same as every bird, if you look closely. He says, what could ever be lost? What could be attained? If we attain something, it was there from the beginning of time. If we lost something, it is hiding somewhere near us, near, near, of course, another word for intimate. Then he says, look at this ball in my pocket. Can you see how priceless it is? Look at this little scrap of grass-like stuff. Can you see how priceless it is? <clears throat> so, you know, Moo might look strange, might look a little uncanny or, or foreign, but it is in fact homecoming. This not knowing, it's the kind of potent doubt that you can rely on to bring you all the way home. 
to ever greater intimacy with your life, in fact, with all life, in fact, with life and death undivided. And so the walls and the mind come down with Mu, and then the heart of reality wakes up. So please, keep it close. It's not knowing most intimate.